Good morning, everybody, from the Johnson Space Center in Houston. Welcome to today's mission status briefing. It's been a busy day for the SpaceX and NASA teams, and here to give us an update on the flight of the Dragon so far is Holly Writings, who is the lead NASA flight director. We're also joined by John Caloras from the SpaceX facility there in Hawthorne, California. So we'll get started with Holly. All right, well, good morning, everyone. Uh, today is a really great day to come and talk to you because it's been uh, very, very successful up to this point. Uh, today we performed our first uh, joint operations uh, with the team at SpaceX uh, in Hawthorne, California. And this is really uh, something we'd been uh, training for, for for many years and really looking forward to. And uh, we're excited that uh, this first operation jointly with that team uh, went as well as it did. So we had a very successful uh, fly under uh, where Dragon flew under the space station about two and a half kilometers uh, below the space station. Again, this was our first joint operation. Uh, we had several activities that we wanted specifically to accomplish with this fly under. Uh, one of those was communication between uh, the Dragon and the space station. We were able to establish that uh, successfully, uh, check out that link both from the crew on board and uh, the ground teams. Uh, and so that was very, very positive. Uh, one of the capabilities that we needed uh, to perform the rendezvous and the capture tomorrow. Um, we also were able to uh, kind of shake out uh, our process of working together. Again, I mentioned we'd been training and practicing that for many years, uh, but doing it for the, the first time with two dynamic spacecraft uh, flying uh, very close together, uh, you always uh, want to make sure that uh, you're going to be able to, to work as, as you trained. And, and I'll tell you that it, it went very, very smoothly. It, it felt exactly like our training, uh, the teams communicated about uh, all of the activities that uh, were performed today uh, in a lot of detail and, and showed a lot of understanding and, and uh, uh, communication. Uh, the other thing we did today, certainly on the, on the space station side, uh, we worked some with our crew as they prepared for the rendezvous and capture uh, tomorrow. Those activities were uh, some training activities, uh, doing a kind of a last run through with the SSRMS, uh, the, the robotic arm that's in the uh, position it will be uh, that they use to capture the Dragon tomorrow. And so they were doing some final uh, training runs with the robotic arm. And they were actually also setting up their uh, displays, their cameras, uh, checking out uh, the crew command panel, which again is how they uh, communicate from a command uh, standpoint with the Dragon. Uh, and we also were able to see the Dragon uh, as, it, as it flew under. The crew reported to us uh, a tally-ho with the Dragon. Uh, the Dragon has a strobe light that was turned on. And uh, as the Dragon passed below the space station, we were, the crew reported they were able to, to see that light, that strobe light. And then our uh, station cameras uh, captured the Dragon as well, which is the uh, picture that you're seeing on display here, our downlink uh, from our external station cameras. Uh, so all of those things wrapped up into, as I mentioned at the beginning, a, a very successful day, a great day in space. And uh, certainly from uh, the NASA side, uh, we are excited about how the mission is going so far. And so with that, I'd like to hand it over uh, to my colleague and my counterpart um, at SpaceX, the Dragon Mission Director, John Kaloris. Good morning. Thanks, Holly. Yes, it's a very exciting day for us at SpaceX. Um, as Holly said, we performed the flyby at two and a half kilometers below station. Uh, all Dragon systems checked out. We look good. We're currently uh, past station now, preparing to fly up and over station overnight and prepare for berthing. Uh, Dragons go for berthing day tomorrow. And uh, right now we're looking good uh, across the board. Okay. We'll take some questions starting here in Houston first, and then we'll go to the phone lines. And since we have Holly here and John out there in California, uh, we ask that you direct your question and let us know who you're, uh, who you're asking it of. So we'll start over here with Mark. Uh, thank you, Mark Corot for Aviation Week. Uh, this is for Holly Riding. Um, can you um, sort of compare what unfolded today with, with what you ex kind of expected or anticipated, even with all of the training? And um, though today was a success, do you feel like you need to caution us that uh, tomorrow is still pretty sporting, or do you feel more confident based on what happened today? 
Okay, so in terms of the training, um, obviously the, the mission's really got two large components. This was the first one, the fly under. Uh, the second is uh, the rendezvous capture birthing activity, um, which will take place tomorrow. We had uh, practiced and trained both of those uh, components. And I'll tell you, today uh, went really very close to how we had trained it. Um, there was no major uh, deviations uh, from our pre-flight plan um, and really nothing that, uh, that we saw uh, that we had not discussed at some uh, point in time uh, prior to the mission. So uh, when you uh, perform operations with the real vehicle, it's always a, a little bit uh, uh, more uh, interesting in terms of you learn things, you see the real data, uh, but all of the pre-flight planning, our flight rules, our procedures, uh, everything held up um, under, under the scrutiny of, of really flying in space uh, with the Dragon for the first time. Uh, in terms of how I feel about tomorrow, um, certainly this is a, a, a demonstration flight, a test flight, um, as, as we've been uh, saying. And to get through this first piece of it uh, obviously makes you, makes you feel uh, positive, but in terms of the activities tomorrow, there's still a lot of really new things uh, that uh, the teams need to, to perform and, and the vehicles, frankly, need to perform. And so, although today was successful, this is still definitely a, a demonstration of flight and a, and a test flight. Thank you very much. I had a follow-up question. Uh, during the activities today, there were, were some difficulties on the station with, um, with the console monitors. and. Um, I realize there's a backup in the lab. I just wonder if there was any after action that's required today and overnight before um, you go forth tomorrow based on what happened today with the monitors or if they're all good to go now. Uh, so the short answer is they're all back in the nominal configuration and, and ready for tomorrow. Uh, specifically, we had one of the monitors at the robotic workstation uh, that uh, kind of froze, that happens periodically, so we had to go through a, a reboot process, just like you'd reboot your laptop, and so it comes back up. Uh, the crew then did use that monitor for various activities, and so we know it's functioning properly. Um, this, again, is, is a standard thing we see with a lot of robotic activities. Uh, they also were performing uh, a calibration of some of our external cameras uh, so that those uh, cameras uh, communicate with the information on those monitors uh, very accurately tomorrow. And uh, so that process took a little bit uh, a little bit longer than expected just because it's the first time we'd really uh, done it for this specific vehicle. We have done that calibration before uh, for uh, other visiting vehicle HCV as an example. So uh, it's just been a while since we'd actually executed that activity. Uh, but again, we got through it, we got the data we needed and everything is uh, set up and ready to go for tomorrow. Philip. Philip Sloss with NASASpaceFlight.com. Uh, I just had a question about the, the timing for today and then also for tomorrow. Um, the, the HA2 burn today was about an hour behind the, uh, I guess, the timeline that we'd seen. Um, is, why was that? And is that going to propagate out for tomorrow's rendezvous as well? Thanks. Okay, so the answer is it's not going to propagate uh, for tomorrow's rendezvous. We expect the rendezvous to be on time for our pre-flight plan. And then I think for the first part of your question, I'll actually let, uh, let John answer. Yes, thank you. So um, that's correct. We ran about uh, 50 minutes from the nominal timeline from the launch. Once we inserted into orbit from Falcon 9, we adjusted some burns in order to meet uh, the height adjust to burn time as close to 0700 UTC as possible. And working with uh, Holly's team, uh, we decided uh, zero, uh, 0747 was our target, and we hit it about 0752. So on the replan, we're actually very close. Yeah, and I'll follow up by saying, you know, again, as, as John said, that was really a, a decision we made just with uh, managing the mission. You know, we had a pre-flight prediction, and then after the Dragon got on orbit and we were able to, to watch um, how it was flying, it made a little more sense to us to uh, start a little bit later in the, in the crew day and make, make sure we had a lot of really solid time to involve them. And so we had a discussion and, and uh, like I said, targeted that a little bit later than we'd planned pre-flight. Um, as they fly around, uh, they will then uh, target our pre-flight time. Tomorrow, we don't have uh, the luxury of starting a little bit later because uh, it's a really long day for the crew, and so we expect to be uh, right back on our pre-flight plan tomorrow. Okay, Robert. 
Uh, Robert Perlman with CollectSpace.com with a question for Holly. Sort of working off of that, if you do run into delays tomorrow, is there a hard time where um, you, would, you would either have to call an end to an attempt to a berthing or if you, um, or if you were grappled when you would have to uh, call and say that it has to remain on the arm until the next day to be birthed? Yeah, so uh, yes, the short answer is yes. And, and really, the biggest consideration is you're, you're kind of managing uh, your, your crew timeline. Uh, you know, they are a resource and, and a consumable, if you think of, about it. We're, they're going to be working very hard all day. So uh, if we were to have challenges as we did the rendezvous, um, there is certainly the option to uh, go ahead and put uh, the dragon in what we call an overnight park position where it stays on the arm overnight and you finish up the berthing. Uh, that's an analyzed configuration. Uh, it's a, it's a pre-planned configuration. Certainly I know uh, everybody would be much more excited if the dragon was birthed. Uh, but if we need to do that, that's something we've discussed. We have all the procedures and uh, it's similar to uh, plans for the other visiting vehicles. So if you're looking for a hard limit, it's really based on, on the crew day and, and how much we need uh, to work them. So there's a fair amount of margin beyond the actual capture time, you know, on the order of several hours um, that we'll be able to uh, go ahead and, and uh, work with, through any challenges and still have enough time to get birth tomorrow. And then even after that, we've got this uh, pre planned activity, this overnight park, which we could use if we needed to. And just a quick follow up on that if, uh, if it did come push to shove, would that be something that, since it's based on crew time, that Don Pettit and the others could call down and say, no, we want to work into the night and you'd allow them? <laughs> so you're familiar with some of our crews and they love to work. Um, uh, it's my job and, and Don's job working with me uh, to, to protect them because they are a resource so we don't want to burn them out in, in one day. Uh, I, I fully expect them to call and say, hey, we'd like to keep going, but uh, it, it's our job as a joint team to, to know when uh, we've done as much work as we need to today and make the decision that we'll just go to the next day and, and preserve uh, really the, the, the team as a resource to, to make sure we can make the right decisions. Okay. Do you guys have any questions over here? No? Okay. Let's go to the phone lines. Uh, I believe that we have Charles Atkinson. Good morning. Charles Atkinson, examiner.com. Uh, for John, what is the current fuel level aboard Dragon, and how does it compare with the pre-flight numbers uh, pre-docking? Uh, certainly. So currently, uh, we are tracking abr above our pre-flight plan. We're about 36 kilograms, if you'd like an exact number, above our pre-flight plan, and we're looking very good. Um, it's a fairly uh, consistent profile to the plan now for the re-rendezvous and berthing, so we should be good. And uh, this protects us if we need to extend, or as Holly said, as a test flight, if we need to take more time and come back around a second time. Uh, one more. Unlike today, uh, will the cameras aboard Dragon allow viewers here on the ground to view the uh, space station pre-docking? So the cameras will be available. We use them. Uh, we need to be over a ground station when we receive video. The cameras will be, or rather, the video system will be uh, connected to our thermal imagers. So we will have uh, video of station, but it will be in the IR spectrum, the infrared spectrum. Okay, and will that be available on NASA TV? Uh, we are feeding uh, video to NASA, and I'll be working with Holly when that's available. Okay, and Holly, my final one is, is May 31st the absolute final day Dragon can stay docked to station? Well, let's see, May 31st is our nominally planned departure day. Um, the Dragon has uh, other... Uh, Landing opportunities, uh, reentry and, and deorbit opportunities, and, and John could tell you some of the specific dates beyond that uh, for Dragon on the space station side. You know, at the beginning of June, we're headed into a, a high beta um, time period for about uh, 10 or so days, and so we'd like to not do any dynamic vehicle activities. Uh, you know, dockings, undockings, berthings, unberthings in that time period. So. Um, May 31st is nominal. We've got uh, a couple of days after that to work with, and then uh, the Dragon, if needed to, could, could stay even longer than that. Thank you very much. Okay. How about uh, Jason with Wired Magazine? Right. Hi, a question for John. Uh, want to know a little bit more detail about the rehearsals and simulations uh, beforehand. If it's possible to get any kind of idea of you know how much time that you worked with NASA on some of these simulations, um, and then in particular, 
Were there any things uh, in the simulation for this next stage, tomorrow's uh, part of the mission, that uh, were ever problematic and is something that you're really looking forward to, I guess, a point getting past beyond the actual birthing itself? Certainly. Uh, I've been working with NASA on this mission specifically for a little over five years now. Uh, we've been simulating for almost three years on various stages, but really the main uh, thrust of our simulations have been over the past year and a half. We've conducted almost 20 joint simulations with NASA and over 40 simulations internally here to SpaceX among the four shifts of operators we have working. So we've been working it very hard. We uh, fly by the mantra of train like you fly and then fly like you train. And so far the mission has been proceeding uh, just like a regular simulation, so we're very pleased with that. Um, tomorrow, as Holly said, it is a test flight, so um, I don't want to jinx myself and say what I can expect and then see something different. But uh, right now the mission is looking just like our simulation, so we're, uh, we're fortunate there. And I'm not expecting anything uh, that we haven't seen in a simulation. Were there any things in the simulation that, uh, you know, that w was sort of that hump that you had to get past or that hump that, you know, caused any issues that you're uh, going to take a breath once it's uh, over tomorrow? Uh, we use the simulations, and as I said, we've been simulating for a number of years. Uh, we use them to iron out work uh, on the hardware as well as in the operation. So it's one of those nice things about SpaceX because of our development process, and we're all under one roof here at Hawthorne. When we find something in a simulation, we'd go back to the hardware people and talk to them about it and be able to iterate back and forth. So I'm not expecting anything uh, that um, the teams at least aren't prepared for. We have a very cracked team. Uh, there's always a chance of something that we haven't simulated coming up, but we also have hardware in the loop here in Hawthorne that we can run against before we do anything on the spacecraft. So again, I'm very confident, and our simulation supervisors have been, uh, they've, I think they've enjoyed torturing us with very uh, unique scenarios, so we're looking forward to uh, birthing day tomorrow. Thank you. Okay. Let's go to Marsha Dunn, Associated Press. Uh, yes, hi, good morning. I have a question for um, John over at SpaceX. What was the atmosphere, the mood like when you completed the operation this morning with um, with such finesse? And I'm wondering, what the, what kind of a, a what kind of a mood does that put you in for tomorrow? Do, 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 you, do, you, do you, are most of the nerves gone now that you did so well? Uh, it definitely does help with the confidence. Again, achieving the uh, C2 mission objectives, the original C2 mission objectives today, is a big confidence boost. Everyone's very excited. I uh, wanted to make sure everyone got to bed, so uh, they're well rested for tomorrow. But uh, it's exciting to be, you know, an American and part of the uh, of putting American spacecraft into orbit, and uh, we're very proud right now. Thank you very much. All right, uh, Clara with Space.com. Yeah, hi. Uh, my question is for Holly, and I'm wondering. When was the decision um, to give the official go-ahead for birthing made, and, and what was the process of decision-making there? Was it just a straightforward thing? Let's see. So it's actually a, a series of decisions. Um, so when we talk about the fly under today, uh, we did sort of step one in that process. So we did a, a go, uh, sort of an official poll, both at the control center in, in Hawthorne and then the one here in Houston. Uh, in order to uh, bring the Dragon up to that uh, two and a half kilometers below the space station for the fly under. As Dragon flies around the space station um, over about the next uh, 20 to 22 hours, there's a, a series of those decision points. And at each one of those, you're checking really the health of, of both spacecrafts and make sure you're still in uh, what you expected pre-flight in terms of your, of your performance and your systems. And so uh, you do that overnight, uh, and then you'll start into your rendezvous sequence. Uh, I think of it, it basically starts at the point where we were, we call it the HA2, the height adjust two burn, 
uh, that's the burn where we started the fly under the day. Instead of uh, going under at two and a half, we'll continue on up towards the space station. And, and you can see each in the graphic that they uh, just put up for me, you can see each of the kind of brown, maybe red colored dots is, a, is another uh, height adjust maneuver. So again, you're, you're turning on the Dragon engines, the, the team in Hawthorne is, and, and moving the Dragon closer to the space station. And each one of those points, again, has a, has a pole, has a, a go in our uh, nomenclature. And, and you're doing that uh, at two and a half, you're doing that at 1.4. Uh, we do that again several times after the Dragon um, is, again, on the R bar, which is uh, kind of that space below uh, the space station, if you do, drew that direct line from the space station down to the, the center of the Earth. And so the final go for berthing um, is actually very close to the space station, uh, so 10 meters. Uh, we call that the capture point. And so after you've uh, crossed through all the gates leading up to that point with an increasing number of uh, systems and, uh, that, that you need uh, to be working correctly, uh, then you give that final go. Again, that's a, a joint uh, pull between John's team and, and my team here in Houston. And then after that, you really turn it over to the crew. You tell them your go for capture. Uh, they take both spacecrafts into a, a free drift, again, so that the thrusters do not fire on either spacecraft and reach out and, and capture Dragon with the arm. Uh, so uh, when we talk about there having been a, 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 a go for berthing, it's really, again, a, a series of activities, the last one being uh, right uh, when Dragon is, is very close to the space station. And that'll occur about uh, 7 a.m. Central Time tomorrow. Again, roughly, because we've got a lot of uh, data to look at and activities to perform. But that's the, the rough time where that last go for berthing will occur. Thank you. OK. Brian Berger of Space News. Brian, are you there? OK. Let's skip to uh, Brendan McGeary with Bloomberg. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Uh, just, a, a, I guess, three parts here, hopefully pretty brief, though. Uh, can you just summarize uh, in brief what, what happened this morning? Clearly, the fly under is, is, is sort of a milestone, but, you know, they mentioned the strobe light there. Just a, a few more just highlights on, on what exactly you guys accomplished this morning. Um, uh, two, where things, uh, uh, you know, uh, will, are going, uh, I guess, th throughout the day. I, you mentioned the, the sounds like the, you know, the race tack, the circling is, is now what's underway. And then three, just confirm for me the, the, the scheduled berthing time for tomorrow. Okay, well, let's see. The first part, I, I actually was going to ask John if, if he wanted from his perspective to, to give you the highlights of, of the fly under since it was uh, his, his spacecraft we were seeing for the first time. Certainly. So uh, right before the uh, flyby, uh, yesterday, yesterday and the day before, we performed some spacecraft checkouts, which included an abort demonstration and then our GPS demonstration of Dragon navigating off GPS by itself, and then a free drift demonstration. And free drift is where we shut down all the thrusters, and we do that at that 10 meter point that Holly just mentioned, prior to being grappled by the arm. So we demonstrated all those, and we we're ready for flyby today. For today, our major mission objectives were to prove first our COTS UHF communications unit, also known as Cuckoo, uh, was able to close a link out to Dragon uh, Cuckoo allows us to communicate between ISS and Dragon uh, at very close ranges. Uh, rough, we're expecting roughly between 23 and 28 kilometers. We we're very fortunate today. We exceeded those uh, going, I'd say, in excess of 90 kilometers. So again, very fortunate. Uh, when you asked what, what were one of those points in the mission I'm kind of holding on to, it was that, and that was a great thing for us. So uh, our Cuckoo unit allows the crew to command Dragon. And we proved that that link works. And it also allows Dragon to know exactly where ISS is by using ISS's GPS state. So as we came in, we performed the height adjust and co-elliptic two burns. And we flew under station, perform, uh, performed some cuckoo operations. And then uh, once we confirmed GPS was working, the crew sent the crew uh, from the crew command panel, which is a panel connected to cuckoo, the strobe on command. And that was really to test that the crew can send a command to Dragon and something that was benign. And uh, we saw that the strobes were indeed on. And then uh, we continued operations. And then the crew, uh, through the same panel, uh, selected the strobes off. So we have proven that, the, that both Dragon can already navigate within close proximity of station and that the crew can command uh, Dragon. So two very important mission uh, points for today. 
Let's see, so I'll, I'll pick up with the rest of your question and add just a few points. Uh, so on the space station side, um, in order to do the, the communication with Dragon, the, the UHF communication, uh, we put the space station in a very specific attitude, which requires us to um, make sure our solar arrays are configured properly. So the type of things we do for um, other visiting vehicles, we also perform for Dragon. And there's a, a box on the space station, uh, the Cuckoo box, uh, that SpaceX uh, built and, and flew up, uh, that communicates with its uh, partner box on the Dragon. And so uh, we made sure that was working correctly on the, the space station side. Um, John mentioned that we, we gathered some relative navigation data. Uh, so it's very important for us uh, tomorrow to make sure that that relative navigation, we call it our GPS uh, data, is accurate. Uh, we did not use it for navigating today as we flew under, uh, but we gathered data. And there's a team of, of experts at uh, NASA and SpaceX, actually, as we speak, uh, pouring through that data to make sure it's all working correctly uh, for when we need it tomorrow as we approach closer into the space station. And so that's a component that's very uh, important to us that we go through that uh, thorough review uh, and, and understand that uh, tomorrow when we do use that uh, capability that the navigation will work uh, correctly. Let's see, you asked too, uh, what else was going on today? So one thing was the data review. Uh, the Dragon will perform a, a series of burns as it, as it goes around the space station. Uh, so the, the joint operations between uh, the control team, operations team here and, and in Hawthorne, uh, again, continues uh, all uh, on the next two shifts before we report back uh, for duty uh, tomorrow. Uh, again, just making sure that uh, the Dragon can end up in exactly the right place to start the rendezvous. Uh, tomorrow. Uh, the crew uh, for the rest of the day today will be continuing on uh, with their preparation. Uh, they've got some conferences uh, to understand and get ready for the Dragon cargo operations, which of course is uh, one of the primary objectives of this of this test, of this demonstration flight, uh, to bring up and, and show that uh, the crew can transfer cargo um, in and out of Dragon. And so they'll be doing some preparation for that activity uh, those activities later in the week and into next week uh, for the rest of their day on orbit today. And I think your final question was uh, birthing time. So I mentioned earlier capture was uh, you know, going to be roughly 700, and I'm, I'm doing it in central daylight time. Uh, birthing's 1030. Uh, it's uh, right about 1030 central time is where it's timeline. And of course, it can move a, a little bit earlier or later, depending on uh, how much time we need to uh, evaluate the spacecraft as it uh, sits below station in that uh, R bar location, uh, but 10:30 is a rough nominal time. Thank you. All right, Irene Klotz with Reuters. Thanks, Josh. Um, I had a couple questions uh, for John. Uh, first of all, would you is your title also a flight director, or what do you? Uh, what's the SpaceX um, designation for for you? And um, also, was there anything in the test today that? Um, you're going to use to tweak anything for tomorrow? Certainly. So uh, first at SpaceX, we use the term mission director, and I'm the lead mission director for the Dragon C2 Plus mission. Uh, we use the term mission director just to distinguish between mission and flight director calls while we're on communications with them, uh, with NASA. Uh, secondly, uh, there's nothing that we would necessarily tweak. Uh, one thing, because Cuckoo closed so far out, I'm feeling very confident that some of our contingency procedures that we were looking to do were uh, it to get in closer will not be necessary. So uh, Dragon looks good, and uh, we don't expect any tweaking. Thanks. And the other question I had is just kind of a technical curiosity about why you use a, um, a video system connected to a thermal imager, and what that gives you beyond um, optical spectrum. Thank you. Oh, certainly. So we actually have a number of video cameras on Dragon, as well as two thermal imagers. Uh, we have two video cameras that point out at each solar array. We use that to check out the arrays, as well as uh, get some pretty stunning views of the Earth. I believe we'll be posting those. And then we have a third camera uh, that's inside the capsule itself. So when the crew ingresses uh, Dragon, they'll, we'll be able to get some pretty uh, good video of that. The two thermal imagers are part of our proximity system. So we use the thermal imagers uh, in coordination with our two LIDARs to give us exact range and range rates uh, to the International Space Station as we're approaching from uh, the R bar, as Holly had mentioned. Because they're thermal imagers, we're able to hook them up via video switch to also get video from them. So it's kind of a bonus. There's uh, no technical reason why we need infrared video coming to the ground. 
Okay, I guess that's it from Irene. Uh, James Dean, Florida Today. All right, thanks very much. Um, John, for a couple of questions, I think. We, we've seen, uh, obviously, a number of vehicles come and go from the station. Could you just remind us why, from, from your perspective, if you're able to birth, it would be such a big deal and, and such a historic event? Uh, certainly. There are a number of uh, unique items of Dragon that uh, other vehicles uh, don't have, the, the biggest one being our ability to re return large amounts of cargo from orbit. Uh, with the retirement of the shuttle, uh, now there's only one other vehicle, the Soyuz, the crew carrying Soyuz, that can uh, return uh, mainly crew members and a small amount of cargo back to Earth. So Dragon has a very significant amount of cargo it can bring back. Uh, furthermore, we're after this mission, we're on contract for at least 12 more missions to the International Space Station. And so we're looking to uh, provide regular services, uh, again, uh, kind of at a faster rate than some of the other vehicles. Thanks. And is it, is it fair to say that your activity tomorrow is much more difficult than what you went through today? Obviously, un understanding that you had to get through this these steps first, but I mean, looking to, to what's next is, is the, the Dragon maneuvers, are they, do they require much more precision and are they more challenging to the, uh, the software systems that you spend so much time working on or could you sort of characterize that? Yeah, I'd, see, I'd say uh, generically speaking, it is definitely uh, a, a more intense day tomorrow. Uh, flyby today allowed us to check out a lot of systems and retire a lot of risk for tomorrow's flight. We were also able to get some uh, uh, additional objectives where we powered up the LIDARs and the thermal imagers, which we use for very close range navigation to the space station, and those checked out good. So again, we retired a lot of risk for tomorrow, but just like what you said, there's uh, more fine maneuvering. The Dragon has a lot of automatic systems on board to protect uh, station and Dragon itself from uh, if, if we uh, see a malfunction. We haven't seen anything that would require those right now but it is the first time we're using them. So it is a test flight, and uh, we, are, we are being uh, cautiously optimistic. Thank you. All right, thanks, James. Uh, last one, Jay Barber with NBC. Jay, are you there? Okay, are there any follow-ups here in Houston? Anybody? Okay, before we step away, let's take a look at uh, the remainder of our programming schedule for NASA television. We will have ISS update uh, later on today at 10 o'clock at the top of the hour, 10 central, 11 o'clock eastern. We will return bright and early tomorrow morning at 1 a.m. central time, 2 a.m. eastern time for live coverage of the grapple and berthing of Dragon. And we will stay on the air throughout the entire uh, operation. At noon central time, we'll have a mission status briefing to uh, take a look at the day's activities and uh, how things have gone. And then on Saturday morning, we will be on the air at 4.30 a.m. Central Time, 5.30 a.m. Eastern Time for coverage of the hatch opening. And then later on that day at 10.25 a.m. Central Time, 11.25 a.m. Eastern Time, we'll have a crew news conference with some members of Expedition 31 as they talk about their experiences and uh, their reflections of the milestone of this mission. So that'll wrap it up for us. As a reminder, ISS Update is up next here on NASA Television at the top of the hour, 10 a.m. Central Time, 11 a.m. Eastern Time. We thank you for joining us.